Okay, hello everyone. So we're just going to get started. Um, so my name is Crystal Wilshire and I'm the Administrative Coordinator here at AgeWell. Thank you for attending. I'm just going to give a brief background on AgeWell and our speakers before I pass it along. So AgeWell partners with 39 universities across Canada. It has over 200 researchers and close to 500 trainees involved in the network. There are also over 250 industry, community, and government partners. AgeWell stands for Aging Gracefully Across Environments Using Technology to Support Wellness, Engagement, and Long Life. The vision of AgeWell is to harness the potential of technology to provide high quality and sustainable services and solutions to meet the needs of the current and future generations of older adults in Canada. This means creating capacity for Canada to further establish its position as a global leader in technology and Canada. Leo Mui is the Manager of Entrepreneurship Initiatives at the Impact Challenge. He has spent the past seven years or as, at the Impact Center, sorry. He has spent the past seven years or so in the Toronto entrepreneurship community. Before joining the Impact Center, he co-founded an infection control and prevention startup and worked at the University of Toronto to redevelop and redesign two buildings on campus in, into co-working spaces, offices, and labs for startups and scale-ups. Dr. Pooja Viswanathan is the CEO of Braze Mobility. Following her passion to help those with accessibility needs, Pooja completed transdisciplinary doctoral and postdoctoral research in robotics and assistive technologies, publishing several peer-reviewed conference and journal articles on smart wheelchairs that prevent collisions and provide wayfinding assistance. Pooja has also had industry experience in various sectors, including banking, telecommunications, pharmaceuticals, and automotive. She currently leads business and customer development at Braze and also acts as a consultant to many Canadian networks and organizations in the areas of knowledge translation and commercialization. So without further ado. Sure, uh, thanks everyone for uh, uh, logging on here today for, for our webinar. Um, and uh, my name is Leo, and I'm here sitting right beside uh, Pooja. Um, just uh, a little, little bit more to my background, and I think it's relevant to the story, um, is that I, I did my, um, my undergrad and my master's in sciences. So um, I'm a scientist. Uh, I, I never really went to, to business school or anything. Um, and, and, and really, it's through um, the Impact Center uh, that, that that's where I learned a lot about um, uh, businesses, entrepreneurship, and uh, right now, working for the Impact Center, um, I, I look forward to do the same for the next generation of scientists and engineers who want to do something uh, uh, with their degree, with their knowledge, with their discoveries. Yeah, and uh, I'm Pooja, so uh, you heard a little bit about my background. In terms of what I'm doing now, I run a startup called Brave Mobility, where we build um, we build solutions for people who use wheelchairs and to really enable them to live more independently and safely. And so the system that I'll be talking to you about later is essentially sensors that can be attached to any wheelchair, transforming uh, a regular wheelchair into a smart wheelchair. Um, what I'm going to be talking about, which is I think really relevant to this conversation, is uh, how Impact Center helped me in that evolution of when I started off really coming in with a, an idea or proof of concept and really helping me nurture that into a real business idea and thinking about uh, what cu cu consumers and customers wanted and really translating that into a product that we ended up launching end of last year. So I'll talk a little bit about that journey and really how uh, some of the, the courses that I took during the techno program at Impact Center really uh, facilitated that. Yeah, thanks, Pooja. Um, I'm going to start off just talking a little bit about the Impact Center. And uh, we are a department at the University of Toronto. We're based right here in, in downtown uh, Toronto's campus. And uh, our, our big motto, as you can see in our logo, is science to society. So we really want to use uh, the, the ample amount of science knowledge and talent that we can find in Toronto uh, and take that to, to benefit society. And so um, we do that by, with several different uh, methods, one of them, it is through entrepreneurship education and training, supporting the building of startups. And another aspect is to uh, work along with uh, um, 
uh, uh, industry and, and uh, other small um, companies looking to accelerate their tech development. But really, uh, uh, my job and for today's seminar, I really talk about uh, training the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. So uh, taking the sciences to society is, is not a necessarily a straightforward um, pathway. It's, um, very rarely do you uh, experience the aha moment in the lab, uh, the eureka moment where you find something and then suddenly it, it becomes something that you know people uh, use outside the lab. Um, there are there's a certain pathway that you have to go through, and so we start off with with say a science discovery or an invention uh, inside a lab. Um, then we package that together maybe with another invention, another discovery, uh, previous uh, 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 products or whatnot, and that becomes sort of like a technology that something that uh, can be used to apply uh, to to do something useful. And then the, the big jump really is taking that technology and, and thinking about what kind of product it can become. So these products solve a real world problem, solve a pain that someone has. Um, and so between that technology and product, you really have to start considering the business factors uh, of things like thinking about consumers and what the market wants, how much people are willing to pay for it. And you have to consider all these points in addition to your technology before you know you could really say that society is benefiting benefiting from it and that society can actually use it you can see from the diagram there are these gray backward arrows because inevitably you have to go back to the drawing board uh you know you put something on on the store shelf you realize that people aren't buying it or or they give you direct feedback that this is how they like to use it not the way you intended so you have to go back to the lab go back to uh, the factory floor, change things up. Uh, so it's, it's back and forth uh, uh, process and it could take a while. And let's just take a look at, you know, a couple of really high impact um, uh, 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 discoveries. For example, uh, quantum mechanics. Um, uh, uh, those publications were made in 1917, but really the, f the first application, you know, the creation of the first laser in the lab wasn't until 1964, and it wasn't until 10 years after that that we saw the first barcode scanners, uh, which is something probably that you know we encounter every day at the supermarket. Uh, that only came in 1974. Um, a similar thing, the theory, the papers were written about uh, nuclear magnetic resonance in the 1930s, um, but then they were first applied to look at molecules in the sample in 1971. Uh, but really, the first MRI machine wasn't introduced to a hospital until 1984. So, you know, think about how much we use MRIs nowadays. Um, can you think about how many lives could have been improved had we gotten to that society part, that MRI, you know, five years earlier, four years earlier? So, um, part of our, our our job and part of what drives us is, is to really think about how we can accelerate that pathway. And again, one of the biggest strategies that, that we focus on is training people like uh, Pooja. She's a scientist uh, and engineers uh, in thinking about entrepreneurship and, and supporting them in building a startup. Because we think that uh, the, the student, the, the science researchers, they are the best vectors uh, to create these um, high impact products that can really, really make benefits to society. And, and um, you know, the rewards are huge. And here's a picture of um, our director, uh, Cynthia Go. Uh, we were working on a project to, to light up uh, homes using, uh, in, in rural Philippines, um, using a, a cheap LEDs and a, a, a solar panel and a battery. And so these are, this was just a, a prototype, but, you know, our goal there was to say, hey, let's give uh, these villages in the Philippines where they have no electricity, uh, four extra hours in a day uh, or at the night, um, you know, where it would normally be super dark, uh, give them that four hours to study, to work, um, to, to, you know, chat as a family instead of sleeping. So what kind of impact can that make going down the line? We don't know, but it's a simple light. And, and you know, we went through that process and, and we're trying to deploy that you know, more widely. Um, so, okay, we skipped the slides, but fine. 
Um, I, we think that like one uh, big thing to, to realize is that uh, we hear about innovation all the time and, and really uh, innovation, one of my colleagues says it's invention plus marketing. So it's not really just your, your, um, your patent that will get you to, to really create something innovative. You really have to construct a business around it and, and something um, is what we are trying to do with our, our uh, folks in techno. Um, so, no, it's okay. That was just a, a slide, but thank you. Um, in, in talking about our, our different programs, so here are just four different programs that uh, I want to highlight from the Impact Center. Um, we really want to say to our students um, to get them interested in thinking about entrepreneurship from a very early stage. And that's what that first program, Entrepreneurship 100 Conversations, um, that really want, we want to get um, students uh, from undergraduate studies to really start thinking about what founding a company means. And so instead of having something super uh, fancy with a lot of business jargon and people wearing fancy suits, we want to have uh, a, a very sort of low-key event, an unintimidating uh, situation where students can hear real entrepreneurs um, on stage talking about their experience, talking about the, the, the highs and lows of having a company and, and really the core reasons of what drives them. And um, it allows them to ask questions and, and uh, to the panelists and to interact. Um, so I encourage you all, if you are in the Toronto area, to, to go to that website. It's uh, open to the public, sign up, and uh, we'll be announcing our uh, upcoming season very soon. Uh, Igniting Impact uh, is a, it's a relatively new program that we have, and I'll talk a bit more uh, in a bit. Uh, but the star of the show today is Techno, and I'll, again, talk about that in a little bit. But uh, the, on the last point, uh, we actually have, uh, we encourage a lot of students to take a try at um, seeing what startup life is like by providing um, uh, work integrated learning opportunities. These are either paid internships or uh, internships that uh, you get a course credit for uh, inside a startup company here in Toronto. And so that gives them an experience of you know, maybe not founding a company right away, but seeing what it's like to, to be in a company where you have maybe two or three people there uh, trying to do something that will change the world. Uh, so Igniting Impact is uh, a new program that we launched last year and it uh, was received pretty well. It, it, it really helps answer, um, uh, it's targeted for graduate students, but undergraduates uh, are encouraged to apply. It really uh, answers the question, hopefully, I have this great idea, or I found this uh, great discovery, so what? What can I do now? Because um, we do find a lot of students want to do something relevant with what they learn, and uh, they, they're, uh, I guess they haven't you know, been through the trenches yet, so they're still uh, feeling that they should do something good for the world, and, and that's what we want to keep encouraging them to do. So we focus on um, uh, getting students to come together, we sit down and we really brainstorm about uh, what problems they can solve uh, in different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, about that. Thank you. 
excuse us for that. Um, we'll, we'll jump back into to the webinar now. Um, uh, really what we would like to do, what we really like to do is uh, uh, to sit down with students to really examine, you know, their ideas and talk about what problems exist outside their purview. You know, uh, growing up here in Toronto, I, you know, I didn't know really the, the detailed problems of the world. But, you know, when, when, um, when we started that lighting project I man mentioned earlier, I really didn't even think about how um, for many people in the world without electricity, their day ends at six o'clock and then they go to bed. Um, so, I mean, it's really that deep understanding that we want to achieve during igniting impact to really get good um, uh, ideas for companies uh, uh, and get solutions flowing really uh, at this early stage. Um, then all the students uh, who uh, have achieved that will, will get a chance to make a short pitch and they win a cash prize at the end of it. And then, um, you know, they're all invited to, to our techno program, which is our main flagship training program. And I'll talk about that uh, right now. Uh, I think, yeah, so they, well, I can skip the slide. We'll go back to it. Um, but techno, again, is our, our flagship uh, um, entrepreneurship program for scientists and, and uh, engineers who want to, to start building a company. And uh, one, one of the things that we have as a staff is that we have expertise in both sort of the technical side, we are all scientists of some sort, um, as well as the business experience. And because of that, we can really identify what part of an idea, what part of a discovery is, is valuable and it's the most feasible to turn into a company. And um, here are just a few examples of techno uh, entrepreneurs who went through the techno program. Uh, on the top left, uh, Dr. Mayro Salvador uh, completed her PhD in chemistry. Uh, she's from the Philippines. Uh, she, you know, grew up in a rural village and she, you know, remembered back at how people are still, to this day, uh, when they get sick, they blame the spirits, right? Um, they don't have that good foundational understanding of bacteria and what causes uh, ill health. So um, she was determined to go back and, and, and train teachers uh, there on how to really improve the way science is taught in, in the country. And, and she's been going back uh, every year since 2010, and she founded a charity called Pueblo Science. Uh, if you're interested in, in teaching science, uh, they need volunteers. So uh, you can just Google them up for that. And, and sort of um, kind of relevant to, to the age well um, uh, uh, the organization is, is uh, immersive. Um, so Arjun is um, a, a uh, one of our entrepreneurs and he founded a company with uh, his friend Vin called Immersive and really it is, uh, they developed this device that has an ultrasound sensor and it helps people who are visually impaired detect uh, head level uh, obstructions. And um, the idea being that canes are only really good from waist down. And so really through a lot of thinking and a lot of, you know, frankly bad ideas, um, we went through that pro uh, process and really got him into to doing this. And now they're in production mode. They have boxes and boxes of, of their product uh, in our storage rooms right now, getting ready to ship them out to customers. So that's a great, great story. And we have another couple of uh, uh, engineers, uh, one who took his thesis and turned it into a um, stabilizing device for high rises. And hey, now a building is going up in Toronto, right around the corner from our office, with their beams. And, and that really makes us uh, really proud. And, and Quincy, there's a more recent entrepreneur. She's a computer scientist. And she's you know, developed a, 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 a method to really optimize decision making. And you know, we work with her to determine, OK, this is very technical, but how do we, um, how do we find a good uh, target for your uh, for your stuff, and we found that you know a lot of medical schools need to to spend a lot of time scheduling uh, 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 interviews and 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 you know picking people who are our top choices versus their top choices. Uh, so they use software to help them with that, and they found a really good niche to work in. So that's you know the type of stuff that we we like to work with, and we you know we we really enjoy that part of the process. So Techno itself is a uh, week-long training program, uh, and it's pretty intensive. 
Um, but then we also provide year-round support after that to, to people who are really continuing. I won't read through uh, everything on the screen. You can do that uh, a bit later, but we are really targeting science students, as I you know, mentioned time and time again, but we really want people who want to build a real company. This is not a course where you come and attend and take notes and you know, do lectures and just learn the, the theoretical side of running a business. We want you to be running a business or starting your business right there in the classroom. Um, and that at the end of it, you, know, you either decide to go forward with something or then you decide, hey, you know, I proved to myself that this isn't gonna work. You know, I'll, I'll go back to the lab or I'll, I'll try again later. And really, um, this, is, this is a unique program, we think, in, in Canada. We haven't seen too many other programs that focus in on, on science and engineering graduate students really making these high impact uh, 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 companies. But uh, I think that's where we, we find our, our, we find some great students who, who uh, uh, have gone through this program. Um, and so really for, for the people out there in the audience who are thinking about um, creating a company, uh, maybe through a program like Techno, we call ourselves an opportunity assessment program. So we want you to, again, bring your expertise, bring your ideas, and we'll go through, you know, in that week, we'll go through a, a brainstorm of that path between science to society and answer these five big questions about really whether, can you make something out of your idea? And, you know, I talked about iterations. If the answer is no, we don't just give up. Um, we then work with them just to talk about, okay, what can we change? What can we tweak? Can we tweak it on the bench side? Can we tweak it on the business side to make it work? And, you know, this is not just during the week. Um, I'm sure many of our entrepreneurs will tell you that two, three years down the line, you will then start pivoting and realizing that, okay, we need to continue to tweak. So um, that is something that all our companies have experienced. It's always changing. Nothing is uh, remaining the same at all, you know, for a long time. So, um, a few of the topics that we talk about, and we try to change things up every year, but these are our core focuses. Um, so, you know, um, I'll highlight the red ones. We really talk about IP. Intellectual property comes in all forms. Um, you know, it's not just about patenting uh, your tech. And so we'll talk a bit more, uh, I'll let Pooja talk a bit more about that in a bit. Uh, but we really talk about things that, you know, what we imagine grad students don't go through in grad school, like you know, how do you do shareholders agreements? How do you talk to your uh, professor, your PI about your idea and you know how to share IP that way? Um, thinking about market research, how, what customer psychology, uh, what triggers people to buy? What are barriers for people to buy? Um, and uh, pitching, doing presentations that aren't uh, scientific conference type uh, presentations. Uh, how do we beat people, the science out of people? Um, uh, really it, it is what we like to focus on um, during that week. And, and the transformation that these scientists make through that week is it's phenomenal. They will come in, you know, most of them are very like, you know, your stereotypical scientists, but then, you know, they, they come out, you know, starting to be able to with what the type of language that the business world understands. Um, oh, next. Do you want me to uh, yeah. I can go back and I can okay, sure. like first before? Um, yeah, so now talking about race mobility. So when I came into uh, the Impact Center, I, and I think I should really highlight this, that you can take a lot of courses on entrepreneurship, but I, I think the value that you get from these programs, um, it, it's so much more when you've already made the commitment to start a business and you're actually in the process of creating a company. Uh, because what I found is I was already sort of had made that commitment to start a company, didn't really know much about it, was in very initial stages, but basically all the learnings that I was getting from these courses, I was applying in real time, right, which, which really helped because, um, for example, when I took the course on corporate structure and um, 
you know, shareholders agreement, I was in the process of, of coming up with a shareholders agreement. So it was, you know, I could literally take the lessons from the classroom and go home and, you know, put those into the agreement. Um, the other thing that's really helpful with Technos, of course, they also have all of the connections to the legals and so on. So even right now, our corporate lawyer is actually a connection that was made to Impact Center. And we get, of course, much better deals because we are uh, affiliated with Impact Center. So we're also able to um, get some of those connections and leverage, um, you know, some of the kind of the in-kind and extra value by being an impact center uh, fellow. So that's sort of around corporate structure, which I, I did definitely um, benefit a lot from. The, the main thing that if I, can, I, I mentioned this to Leo earlier too, the one um, session that really popped out in my head was uh, when Dr. Cynthia Goh came in and she drew these circles that talk about intellectual property. And she talked about separating your company from, you know, your academic institution. And so a lot of us, I think when we're HQP and we're working on IP, um, we, we kind of feel very constrained to our academic environment and we're not clear on, uh, or we don't even realize sort of, you know, where we can move without, you know, getting the agreements and stuff sorted out with the universities or the institutions that we're affiliated with. One really important learning that came from Cynthia was saying, okay, well, you've got the IP that lives in the institution and, you know, that's IP that's probably going to come into your company, but you need to simultaneously create your company and create IP that's your own. Um, and, you know, that could be very different from the IP that's in the institution. Um, so, for example, a lot of the work that you might be doing in research is sort of more R&D work, but then there's a lot of product development that needs to happen to move that research uh, into a real product. And that can happen in the company. So, while you're you know, negotiating and discussing things with the innovation office, that, that doesn't prevent you from still creating new IP in the company that then the company owns. So I think that was a really important lesson because what it meant was I got to start my company and start creating IP. And in the meanwhile, um, I, I started the negotiations with, uh, with you know, all of the, the academic institutions regarding what IP needed to be licensed and what didn't. And that really helped because ultimately, also, you know, those, these discussions went on for about a year, a year and a half. But at the end of that, it became very clear what IP even needed to be licensed or not from the institution. And that's really important because when you're running the company, you're, you're actually trying to find out what the customer needs are and what their needs are might end up being very different from the IP you created in the institution. So it's really important to separate that. And so I wanted to bring that up because that was a really important learning for me. Um, and then in terms of market research, understanding the customer as well as the development of the value proposition, I'll go over that on the next slide. Um, but really, kind of again, you know, in all of these courses, everything that I learned, so for example, we did an exercise on customer persona. Um, and then Charles Plant, who is, you know, we still look to for advice, uh, is really great in terms of marketing and business development, um, taught us about the importance of learning how to um, market to your customers and so learning their language. And so we went back and because we were doing customer interviews at the time uh, in real life when creating the company, we, we built in a lot of those lessons. So we changed the way in which we were doing our interviews and we changed the way in which we were listening to our customers. So we started taking a lot more detailed notes on the kind of language that people were using. Um, so a simple example of that is when we started, uh, safety was a word that we used quite often. And coming from the research where we had mainly talked to therapists, we thought of our product as really the main value proposition being increasing safety. But when we started talking to our end users, we realized safety was not really uh, a sexy term to use with them because it, it, um, it had the connotation or the implication that they were unsafe otherwise. And so what we realized was, you know, the language around increasing awareness and independence was language that resonated much, uh, much uh, better with our customers. So that was a, an important learning as well. So if we can go to the, um, Next slide. So, so a lot of us have seen the business um, model canvas, and I really like just this very simple triangle because um, I think this is really where things need to start. Because I think business canvas, um, the business model canvas can be very overwhelming for people when you're just starting out and when you're coming in with an idea. There might be a lot of pieces that you just haven't figured out in that in that model yet. So things like you know revenue streams and cost uh, cost structures and things like that. But this triangle is actually really key because you can iterate along these points in the triangle. And, and the main sort of thing to remember here 
is you don't, it's a triangle, you don't need to start in a particular place. You can start anywhere on this triangle and keep iterating along all of the three points. So, for example, a lot of us who come from research actually come to this triangle with a solution already developed, but we don't quite know the problem we're solving and we don't really know the market that we're going to be addressing. And so you can start with the solution, but then basically go out to your customers and figure out their pain points and figure out if you have, uh, you know, if your self solution is actually solving that problem, if you need to maybe consider a different problem, if you need to consider a different solution, and then you iterate over and you, you look at your market and you say, well, is this actually a big enough market for me to address? And if not, you know, you change your market. Now maybe that affects your solution. Maybe it affects the problem. And so the idea is that you keep iterating around these three points until you come up with a, um, you know, a value proposition that you think is unique and something that your customers are going to want to pay for. Um, and so here's the, the example of the triangle that we started Techno with. And so the images that you're seeing there on the bottom are a wheelchair with a Kinect camera. So that's the stereo vision camera um, installed. And this system would detect obstacles and automatically stop the chair if the person got too close. So um, essentially it was you know, built for people with uh, older adults actually with dementia in long-term care. So the market that you see up there was long-term care residents with cognitive impairment who need a power wheelchair. The problem that we were trying to solve was um, these residents being unable to drive safely. The solution that we'd come up with was this sort of aftermarket um, you know, camera, um, a processing system that would automatically correct their speed. And really the value proposition, this of course wasn't very well thought out, but we came in and said, well, the value proposition is that we're helping prevent collisions. So we took this triangle, went out, we talked to people, and we, and, and, and then you know, of course, you know, there's all of the different aspects of, of the business model canvas as well. We're looking at what are our barriers to entry and so on. And we found a number of issues with this triangle. So one, because there was the aspect of intervening with the wheelchair controls, there were regulatory barriers to getting to market. So we would need FDA uh, approval as a class one or class two device. Access to our target market was limited because it was long-term care residents. Even accessing long-term care residents to talk to, to interview, was actually really challenging. Even in the past when we had done user studies, recruiting a large number of older adults with dementia was quite challenging. So even accessing that market was hard because of the rules around provision. So a lot of older adults with dementia are not even being allowed power wheelchairs, which is sort of why we started this project in the first place. So that meant that there were few users that had power wheelchairs that we could even test this kind of technology on. The market size is very limited. Um, the cost for something like this, especially because of all of the regulatory approvals that we would have to go through was high. And um, what we found was for those who work mildly cognitively impaired or cognitively intact, they found this intervention too excessive. So when we went out in the community and started um, getting people to try the system, they said, well, I don't, I don't like that the wheelchair is stopping me. I'd like to, um, I just like increased awareness, but I don't really want to give up the control. Uh, the other challenge that we had was when we started, you see that the camera was placed on the front. And so initially we were looking at a system that would uh, provide coverage, not just you know, essentially all around the chair, but what we found was designing a system that could mount on the front of the chair and not essentially feeling like a cage to the person who was sitting inside was very challenging. Um, whatever we did, it just sort of made the, made the user feel very caged in, and we weren't quite sure also the need for a system that would look for obstacles in the front. So these are all the issues that we had come up with at the beginning. And this is where we ended up. So. Uh, as of last year, our products are what you see now on the on the left and right there. So these are predominantly for rear visibility. So these are sensors that can be attached to the rear of the chair. The image on the right is sort of a more um, versatile unit where these sensors can be attached essentially anywhere on the chair. But you notice that it's a fairly compact system. Uh, it's also very simple compared to uh, the first version where it's not providing any sort of intervention. It's really just a tool to increase awareness and the person maintains control. So what that meant was we eliminated several of the issues that I talked about earlier regarding all of the barriers to entry. We opened up our market. So on the top now, we're looking at mobility device users with rear visibility issues. So that includes now manual power wheelchair users, scooter users, 
uh, but goes well beyond the context of just long-term care as well as like out into the community and, and other settings as well. Um, the, the solution um, here is a visual haptic audio feedback system. And really the problem that we're predominantly trying to solve is not being able to see rear obstacles. And, and, and really it's a bit more general than that. It's really just not being able to see obstacles in people's blind spots. Um, so that's, that, that's really what this exercise did for us, is iterating through all of that, helped us find a market that was large enough, find, find a problem that you know, a lot of customers had, and come up with the minimum viable product that would solve that problem. And so the new value proposition is now what you see on the right, which is far more um, detailed and thought out and where it's much clearer where the unique value is of what we offer. So Pooja, how long did it take for you to go from the first triangle to this triangle? Um, I say it was a little over, uh, probably about a year, uh, and we're still iterating. So I think that's the important thing to remember about the value proposition is it's not really an exercise that you just start and complete. It's, it's never done. You're, you're constantly trying to, you know, like we're now, um, you know, further, further refining our value proposition um, and also refining it for different target users because now we have um, institutions that we sell to in addition to consumers and the value proposition for those for those both of those types of customers is really is quite different um, so it's an ongoing exercise but definitely you know in, in some senses we have to go back to the drawing board after that first prototype that we had and it was you know we went from doing essentially solution interviews of hey you know what do you think of this and then when we realized nobody liked it we basically had to go back to problem interviews and open up our interviews you know assuming nothing now and just saying, hey, what are the problems you have in navigating? And what we kept hearing time and time and again is it's really difficult to back up. And of course, once we heard that, it was just a dull moment. Cause, I mean, we have sensors in cars that help us do that. And, and you know, there's nothing like that for wheelchairs. So, um, so in some senses, you know, the backward arrows that we were talking about is exactly what we went through, where we came up with a solution, but then we had to essentially go back to our problem um, redefine our problem and there were you know obviously many lessons learned that we could still you know wasn't a complete waste there were a lot of things that we could um, that you know we could bring forward into our new solution but it had to be essentially an exercise that we had to do from scratch yeah yeah so I, I think that explains why these the commercialization of these things take so long it, it's not you know you know it, it's really finding that precise niche and this second triangle this beautiful triangle here um, you know it I don't think you could have come up with that just from scratch. Um, and, and so, I, yeah, I'm really proud that you went through that process because, you know, we see a lot of people, you know, um, sort of run out of steam and and, and um, we try our best at, and, and at the Impact Center to, to get people through the humps because, um, you know, it, it can be tough to, to, to give up basically what you came in with because you thought coming in with that this was a great idea. Mm -hmm. And then having to give that up um, and then push through is, is not easy. But um, I'll go back a little bit to talk about what our role is at the Impact Center. And, and uh, we have a number of mentors um, and we, we meet regularly with, with our entrepreneurs. And, and we like to see ourselves as uh, being on the side of the entrepreneur. So one of the questions that we always get, get asked is like whether we take equity or, or ownership in, in companies that we help. And the answer is no. Um, we don't provide any early stage funding for them and we don't want to take any part of them because, you know, we feel that that, you know, gives, puts us in a conflict uh, position. So we want to be able to help them because, uh, for the right reasons, because we believe that they have the capability of creating a product that could really uh, benefit the world. Um, and, and so when we try to talk to them about, you know, uh, hairy topics like um, shareholder agreements and 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 um, and intellectual property and funding and money uh, those things we won't be entangled with our own interests and, and we really want to advocate for the best interest of the company and the entrepreneur again because we need them to make benefits to society and I, I think uh, Pooja already mentioned the, the last point about you know we really stress from the beginning about how it, important is to separate company work from, from your academic work. And that includes separate notebooks, separate, you know, work spaces, um, just to say, hey, this is my day job and this is my company that I'm running sort of from five to nine. 
Um, and so we really, really want to make sure that we, we, we talk about these things so that, you know, students who come in knowing nothing are, aren't um, uh, just floating around the water waiting for the shark to come and, and swallow them up. And, you know, I, I mentioned about our, our Techno Week and those are seminars and, and, and work time uh, that our, 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 uh, our starter companies will spend a lot of uh, effort at, at creating their company. But we also have a year round support. Um, so one big thing that we, we can supply is uh, a, a workspace that's away from the academic lab um, that has prototyping equipment that people use. And, and Pooja, uh, I know that Brace has used a number of different things. So we, we have a, a vacuum former in there, a laser cutter, uh, 3D printer, pick and place machines and a wet lab. Uh, and, and really, um, what I really love about that space is that people start taking care of, of the pieces of equipment that you know, are important to them. So uh, Braze has an employee that you know, really takes care of this, uh, the laser cutter. Whenever it breaks down, he's the one to service it. You know, we don't have uh, a staff all the time in the world to, to clean it up. So there's lots of good self-policing around the, the area. Um, and, and so it, it's actually a pretty good um, uh, community where like different startups know each other really well uh, and start helping each other throughout, you know, because a lot of companies, frankly, face the same problems as they grow up. Um, so the, the, the co-location of all these equipment is also important for companies because, you know, they, they don't have time uh, to run around the city going from place to place to place just to test out a slight iteration to a, to a prototype. And um, really our, our interaction with, uh, with Startups, we, I view it kind of like um, a, a graduate school pro policy, at least the, it's the way graduate school worked for me, is that, you know, we were pretty much, we would leave the companies to do their own work. We won't bother them too much. But our doors are always open for, for chats. And we always walk around so that they can always come up to us and ask quick questions or set up meetings for longer chats. Um, and then we would, you know, sometimes ask them to, to, to come in to me just to check on their progress. Um, we don't have a um, ticking clock to say that you have to finish within uh, so many months or else you'll be kicked out. Uh, as long as everyone's making progress and we can see that they're working towards their goals, you know, they can stay because we understand that these things take a long time. Um, and because we do talk a lot on, on these one-on-one -on -one meetings, we realize, you know, sometimes that a group of companies would have the same, same problem or similar problems. So that's when we bring in um, maybe external speakers or we ourselves will conduct a, a relevant uh, workshop or seminar uh, for them to, 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 to sort of work through a problem together. And then, you know, these one-on-one -on -one meetings beyond just progress updates, uh, we do a lot of pitch practicing. Um, our companies do, you know, bring in a lot of their money through pitch competitions and, and eventually when they're looking for investors, they have to make these pitches. So we do hours and hours and hours of, of, of pitch practices. If we go back one slide, um, this group is actually immersive. If you recall, they have the um, device for, for the visually impaired to detect head level obstruction. Um, and so uh, we, we worked with them and, and, and uh, Immersive eventually won 100, 
a hundred thousand dollars at the uh, Telus National Pitch Competition. So we were super proud of them, but I mean, we worked with them for for a good 12, 15 hours before that just to refine their pitch. Um, and, and of course, we we have we are able to give um, them some good deep insights and recommendations, uh, especially in the field that uh, we are in, uh, because we do work with industry. We chat with government. We keep our eyes and ears open at all times uh, for these recommendations. And uh, the lastly, the laugh and cry, it's true. Um, you know, there are really happy moments when someone gets their first sale, uh, when someone's uh, patents get approved, and then there are some really uh, sad moments. And we laugh together and cry together, and and because uh, we understand that, you know, in order to to really push through this uh, entrepreneurship path, you have to you have to let your emotions go, and then the next day you come into work and and you focus back on on what you need to do. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to say about techno, uh, but you know, just mentioning something that we do elsewhere is that, uh, you know, we travel around. Um, so one of the things that we have been doing is, is uh, we've been doing the pitch training session section for the, for the H-12 uh, summer institutes. Um, and beyond that, we, we do a lot of other types of training uh, around the province, uh, across Canada. So uh, you might see us someday in your, in wherever you're from. Um, and, and we're always happy to, to talk to individuals who are interested, but maybe not fully committed yet to, to joining Techno. Um, that's about it from me. And so we'll see if there are any questions. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you will see a Q&A box um, that you can type your questions into, and then I will read them aloud for anyone to answer. I mean, for Pooja or Leo to answer. Are there any questions in the room? Yeah, I guess, um, would you be able to give some examples of some of those cry moments? That people go through. Um, yeah, I think you know one of them is, it was kind of like a partial happy cry. Um, you know, it, it was one of those moments where the one of the co-founders of the company realizes that he can't continue anymore because he's having a baby. So, um, and oh, his wife's having a baby, but um, uh, so so it, it was tough because you know they put in a lot of hours into it and then they eventually just realized that you know. They, they needed some more stability. And um, so that was a, yeah, you put me on the spot, but I think that was something that I remember. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've had our own cry moments for sure. It's just things that are unpredictable. Um, you know, things like distributors being like so close to signing on with them and then something as crazy as, you know, they, they get acquired um, by somebody and now the agreement is gone. So, um, stuff like that actually ha has been happening to us fairly often just because of the where the space is at right now. It's uh, you know it's a, it's a very volatile space in terms of mergers and acquisitions. And so we're finding that um, a lot of discussions you know can be very, very positive and we see a lot of momentum and things just suddenly fizzle out. And uh, I think the, you know I haven't let that sort of affect me too much mainly because I've also heard of colleagues who have gone through similar things where, they've been at it for two, two and a half years and gotten to almost the end of, you know, like all the discussions are done regarding manufacturing and cost, and then the, the company decides to pull out of the deal. So um, I think you, at some point, um, I think the lesson there is to not put all your eggs in one basket and to make sure that you've always got plenty of options and plenty of, uh, uh, of their discussions that you're having in parallel and not kind of hold your hold your breath for any specific partner. So I think because we knew that that had happened in the past to others, I think we, you know, I maybe I've just also become, <laughs> you tend to become sort of numb, I think, after a while where you don't, um, you don't get too affected by the positive or the negatives. I think you just learn to keep your eyes on the prize and yeah. you just keep going and you just, you just don't let these things get to you too much, positive or negative, really. I, I don't find myself celebrating too much either because you, you just no, never know. So. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the right approach, but it, it works for me. So whatever works, I think. Yeah, and having a short memory works. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you know you can live out your emotion, but again, go home, you know, have a sleep. The next morning, again, you're back working on your company. No matter if you just had a big win or a big loss, you have customers to talk to. You have prototypes to make. There's so much work to do all the time. Yeah. 
that. Really, I think, you know, if, if you're in that good state where you're working super hard all the time, you don't have time to think about your emotions too much because, you know, you, you know what the big vision is and, and you're going towards it. Yeah, and I think as long as that vision is really tied to your customers, because that's the one thing in, in those cry moments, I know what's worked for me is to not associate wins and, and losses with like the money that you're getting or, you know, those kinds of things. It, it really does end up being, you know, how many smiles you, you put on, you know, on your customers' faces. And so for me, some of the toughest moments I've gone through by watching some of our testimony videos, like our testimonial videos, where they're talking about our system and how it's impacted them. And that generally like gets me going in no time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's easier when you kind of um, hold on to those intangibles rather than. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I went through the same thing volunteering for, for Pueblo Science in, in the Philippines. Uh, nothing was working. All the agreements that we had of people preparing things, that all fell through. Uh, and then you see the teachers um, telling you stories about how they traveled for seven hours by bus just to attend this course so that they can teach their kids better. I mean, that just makes your whole, like, whatever hardship that you you think you're going through uh, uh, it makes you feel so much better and and you know uh, now that again coming from the other side working the impact center seeing our companies talk about their customers and, and maybe travel to, to do again to impact society um, yeah that that makes me tear up so yeah. it's lots of happy cries as well um, so I guess I'll ask the final question um, if you could both give one piece of advice to new entrepreneurs, what would it be? Uh, I don't want to steal yours, but uh, I guess it, it's really is it's when, when we try to tell people to listen to your customers, really listen to your customers. Do your best to clear your brain of any prior assumptions of what your customers like, um, and and really focus on that and just solve their problem. Um, and really, at least for your first iteration, only solve their problem. Uh, a lot of the tech folks love adding new features. We call that feature creep. Uh, no, just solve the problem that your customers are telling you, and then uh, that's a good first step. Yeah, and my actually um, advice is closer to that second part that you just said is, as a scientist or an engineer, we tend to wait too long to get a product out there. So one thing that I, we were just talking about actually as a team yesterday was, we're so glad that we launched, even though we didn't think we really had our product really as, as, as good as we, we wanted to, um, but it helped us achieve so many other things. So when we, when we launched our first product, it was big. You know, it wasn't, we, we wanted something way more compact, but we heard that people were willing to pay for it. And so we just launched it. And what that allowed us to do was get a product out there. We still sold out our first run anyway, um, but in the meanwhile, we continued our R&D, and now we have something that's less than half the size. And so for our next production run, we're going to have a much better product. But those, you know, those units that we sold in the first run also gave us so much important feedback. It told us what our sales cycles were. It told us where our early adopting markets were. Like, it just gave us so much information. Um, and, you know, bottom line, trust when your customers say they, they will pay. Like, you know, they, if they say they're going to pay for something, just let them pay for it. And don't worry about, you know, trying to perfect it more. Um, just get it out there and, and how, at least let it solve some people's problems. And then you can work on improving the product later on. But I think getting it out there as quickly as possible, you never know, you know, in our case, had we actually launched your product even sooner, we probably wouldn't have ended up with our, our distributor issue where, you know, it literally we got the unit to them and a month later they got acquired. If we had gotten that unit to them maybe three, four months later, we would have had a deal. So timing is, is, is so crucial that you, you don't want to delay things, you know, as much as you can to try and get a product out the door as fast as you can. Yeah, so good is good enough and your first product is likely not your last product. 
Okay, well, thank you to you both. Um, for everyone that is still with us, I just want to let everyone know that our next webinar will be in September, on September 18th. It will be a second iteration, it will be the second of two parts. The first part was in May, um, so it will be given by Krista James, who's the National Director for the Canadian Centre for Law, and you can link to the webinar via the link that was put in the chat box. Um, and then you can also check our website for a list of upcoming webinars. We will be launching our 2018-19 series in September. So please visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, and you will get the information that way. If anyone has any questions um, that they didn't get to ask in the webinar, please feel free to email us at info at agewell-nce.ca and we will either answer your question or forward it to our two panelists. Um, and that's all. I hope everyone has a good day. Bye.